birthday. And this uh, shirt is part of my trip from Africa, and my wife and son are in matching outfits because they love me and they put up with me. The, uh, but in Africa, when you have a major occasion, uh, especially in the Ivory Coast, when you have a major occasion, you create a fabric for it. So they made tons and tons of this fabric. This is their dedication day. And so that's why it'll say like dedication on there. And they have the longest church names in the history of the known universe. So they put their entire church name on it. So when they're dedicated, and then you just buy the fabric and you make your clothes because everyone there pretty much can make their clothes or they know a neighbor who's a tailor. And so they tailor your clothes for you. And so on their dedication day, if you look at the photos on their Facebook page, that place has 1,500 people in there and about 1,000 of them are wearing the exact same fabric because that's how they roll. So when they have a special occasion or a special event, that's what this was. So they put the tape measure guy on me and gave me this shirt and said, absolutely, I'll wear it. Absolutely, I will. And no, it does not come with batteries, and I do not need a disco ball. Thank you for asking, though. Many of you have asked me that. The, uh, I've come back from, if you're new to the church and you're wondering, who's the strange guy, man? I like the church the past two weeks. I don't know if we're going to stay now. Yeah. The, uh, was in Abidjan, uh, Ivory Coast. Abidjan is a city of four million people. There's more people in that city than there are in the entire state of Kansas. So we were outside the city a little bit, but when we arrived, Pastor Nufe met us uh, and Michael Brew's parents. Michael Brew is a student at Pitt State, and that's how the connection was made with uh, our, 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 myself and that church. And, uh, and so Pastor Nufe and Michael and his parents were in service a while back, about last year, and Pastor Nufe came up and uh, gave him gave him seven, eight minutes to share, and 15 minutes later, he was done, and you all gave him a standing ovation, if you remember, and it was powerful, and he invited me out to come speak, so I spoke Sunday morning, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, head off on Saturday, and then spoke Sunday morning. Now, the services are a little bit different, because on Sunday morning, the first Sunday, the service was 165 minutes long before I got the pulpit. Yeah, and no, there's no air conditioning in the service. And yes, I had to dress nice, so I actually had to wear the suit that I marry and bury in. This past Sunday was different. The service was 180 minutes long before I got a chance to speak. It was a four and a half hour service, and nobody got up to leave, and no one even had to use the bathroom, it seemed like, during the service, because they were just there and so ready to go. So we did the basic photo ops of rep in Ohio State uh, in front of the Albigeon sign. OH! I got, one, I got one fan, all right, all right, I knew I would. And repping the flag shirt in front of the Abidjan sign as well. I read, the entire time that I was there for two weeks, I was in nothing but Speed the Light vehicles. If you are a teen and you have given towards Speed the Light, thank you, I rode in two of those vehicles. If you're an adult, you've come to our Valentine's banquet or you've helped out in any of the miscellaneous work fundraisers, you ever sold concessions at a Pitt State game and you're wondering, what is that Speed the Light money going to? I rode in two Speed the Light vehicles and it wasn't just going ahead and going down basic roads. There were times that we needed the heavy-duty vehicle. That is not a river, that is a road. Be thankful for the sewer system that you have, even if you think it does not work well enough. That is a road that we are on. And I know it looks like we're in Venice, Italy, on a gondola, but that is a road that we are on. The missionaries that I served with were Brent and Shelley Teague. They work their tails off. They are doing an amazing job. Shelley preaches regularly. Brent was my interpreter as well as my preacher. Uh, when they get back in the States, we will have him come. Brent was left for dead in 2004, shot by the Taliban when he was missionary in Niger. He was actually raised in Ivory Coast. Their ministry is amazing. The one day we were outside of the town of Abidjan, we went to a Bible college, and I got to see the computer lab. The computer lab is donated computers from Americans in Assembly of God churches who donate them to the missionaries, Stu and Sandra Van Arsdale, that we support. If you give towards missions, you help to get those computers in that Bible college room. And if you're wondering, does that ever really happen? I was in the room in Ivory Coast where they had those computers that Stu and Sondra received as donations, and Stu went over there and set them all up so those Bible college students can get the training they need, and they are highly trained. They have 1,100 Assembly of God churches in that nation, and they don't have enough pastors for all of them, but their pastors are very, very well trained. Uh, that is a picture of a building on the Bible college with a missionary in front of it for scale. That building is what they call a tabernacle. It's a simple-sized building that they put up. They put the steel, they put the concrete down, they put the steel up, they put the roof on, and then the, the, the Bible college or the church can finish it out however they want on the sides. But I got the privilege of being in their factory. They actually let me near the tools, but they didn't turn any on. It used to be they made all these kits over here in America and then shipped them over. Brent now has an entire construction facility where they're making those tabernacle kits. Friends, for $6,000, they put a building up that is 50 foot, 55 feet wide by 36 feet wide span with a roof, and a church can fit 300 people in that space. We have 250 chairs set up in here. 
They put 300 people in that space. In the past three years, they have erected 74 church buildings in that country just by this method. And we would drive through towns, and then we go through the town, there's only two nice buildings in the whole town. I mean, you see them. There's the mosque, and there's the Assembly of God Church. There's plenty of other churches that church denominations over there, but there's the Assembly of God Church, and they built it with a tabernacle. They had, I, I met a pastor who had driven six hours to hand deliver a thank you letter to the missionary so that he could send it to Tuxedo Assembly of God in Bartlesville because they just had seven guys come up and they put up four tabernacles in seven days. It's amazing what they're doing. The church I was with is the largest church in the nation, and that is the church. That is Pastor Nupe leading his congregation. They recently dedicated their building a, a, a few a months ago, hence the shirt. The uh, Pastor Nufe, when he was here, uh, he came to, like, that Friday. And so I knew they were coming, and so they're, they're a delegation from Africa, man. They've come a long way. So I cleared off some time on the calendar. I put the Africa shirt on, and I gave them the whole tour of the facility. Every 10 steps, they're taking photos with their iPad all over the place. They had owned their iPad for an entirety of 36 hours because their favorite place in America was the, the buffet. They go, how can they make money? They're only charging us $6. And Best Buy. Because over there, it's a whole lot more expensive to go ahead and buy electronics, a whole lot more expensive. And so the, uh, when he was here, we walked him through the building, and I believe it was my wife's idea to go ahead and give him this. Think about this for a moment. We gave them those when he was here last summer. Two things. One, the cookies are expired. Two, he didn't want to eat them because he wanted a memento of being here. When I walked through his office and saw those there, I almost started crying. The kingdom of God is not bound by color, by hemisphere, by continent, by court decisions, or by style, however you want to dress them up. The kingdom of God is much wider than that. And so we took him a gift as well, got him a computer bag with the flag logo on it. I was told they would like that. They love swag. What can I say? They love swag. Stuff. Duh. They love swag with names on it. The colors on the logo are actually the colors of their flag. But while in his office, he showed me a file. And uh, that file is pastor after pastor, because Pastor Nufay is high up in the, in the leadership there in the assemblies in Ivory Coast. Pastor after pastor, approximately 50 or 60, saying, please send us a tabernacle. Please send us a tabernacle. Can you please send us a tabernacle? They have people, but they have no place to meet. Then he just started showing some other stuff, and so I just started snapping photos real quick. This is a church. This is the walls of the church. The reason it has no roof is because it was burned down by Muslims. It's in the north part of the country. And so they just went ahead and reset up this part of it, so they're meeting in here right now. If they could get a tabernacle, it would be beneficial to them. This is the building, that another church that was burned by Muslims, and there's the believers standing in that, and they have no other way to get the building up. And this is a Sunday school room where the kids are meeting, the, uh, and they got a tarp over it, so that means they're doing okay. They can block the sun a little bit. It's amazing what can happen when other people come together and just help them get a simple structure up. And they'll put the walls up. Concrete's cheap and labor's cheap. They'll be glad to do that. I went over there as the pastor of a local church just to teach at another local church. I took them through a series on Philippians, always talking about joy, because Philippians is a book filled talking about rejoice always. I had no idea that they had been through a civil war, that uh, their, their last free election they had, the party that got elected pretty much incarcerated the opposing party, 3,000 of them that are still in jail. There was a lot of hurt and bitterness. I was unaware of this. I kept getting told after each message, you have no idea how well that fits. And that wasn't just the pastor being nice to me. That was the missionary going, dude, you have no idea how well that fits. And that's the missionary leading the altar time at one of the evening services. Uh, the altars were full. People were, were amazing. The music was drop dead amazing. The color of Africa is not skin. It's fabric. It's fabric all the way. And uh, you may have seen some of these photos. They gave me some fabric, and that's my chief outfit. I know it does not look like a Kansas City Chiefs outfit, I know. But that's the Chief outfit, no, I would not wear it because it's way too hot. Way too hot. Yes, well, I got fed wonderfully and ate tons of stuff that you would probably throw away or shoot, run over with your car. It was excellent, and it really made connection when you're willing to eat things like foo-foo, and yes, the word is foo-foo. It is foo-foo. When you walk into a room, guys, and it smells like a ladies in spray and lavender, that's not the smell of foo-foo. I know what the smell of foo-foo is now, and you don't want it. You don't want it. Now, now the, uh, the goat stew, you want that. The, uh, uh, the grouper fish kebabs, trust me, you want that. Fried plantains, yes, you want that. The achike is great. The tuna steaks were awesome. Not tuna, but tuna steaks. The grilled rabbit was even good. It was great. I was confident I was going to come back getting 15 pounds, but I didn't. But we went over to be a blessing to the local pastor 
and the church he pastors and his family. And uh, it seems like that's what we accomplished, and I'm thankful for that. But I'm most thankful for my wife because without her enthusiastic support, and not just a, sure, go ahead, I don't care, go ahead and go if you go, but an enthusiastic support, this would not have happened. And for that, I'm very grateful. Would you help me thanking my wife for holding down the fort? <laughs> Amen. Now, what I learned while I was there was a totally different perspective. And that's what we want to make the change over as we go to the message this morning. When you get a different perspective on something, things are totally different. And things that could seem so important to you, like this is the best church in the world, this is the only place I could ever be, you go somewhere else, you go, wow, they do that differently, but it's not right or wrong, but it's different. We do a 70-minute service, and if it goes 75, there's maybe a, maybe a nurse care worker going, hey, help me out, or a parking lot person going, hey, man, we got jammed up. They go four hours, and they're like, are you going to go another 30 minutes? We're good. We're good. Is that right or wrong? It's different. But when you get things in a different perspective, it changes things. That is the Eiffel Tower. That is a legitimate photo. But it has something on it called tilt shift. It's a photographic, photography technique that causes some things to look miniature in a normal photo, while other things can still look full size. Have we ever done that here in, in our world? Where everything that is in our world, we make it think it's so big and so important, but we think eternity is small and tiny and not to be desired? Could it be possible that we've got the wrong perspective and we've got the wrong shift and maybe if we refocused and we focused on eternity a bit, that might help us here on this planet as well? All cultures and anthropologies pretty much suggest that we are eternal. That it's God-given. Those that would believe in God and Jesus Christ and those that don't. Whether you are a believer today or maybe you're not. Maybe you're just scoping this out. Maybe you're just here for a special occasion. Or maybe you're here because someone promised you free lunch and a free, free cappuccino or something. But nearly all of us think there's something past this life. And why do we? Is it just selfish, hopeful thinking? And we're just hoping that there is because we don't want our existence to end because we're so selfish and we're so self-centered? Or is it embedded? And if it's embedded, by what? I mean, do cats and dogs sit there and go, hmm, eternity, hmm. I don't think so, especially cats, no. Dogs maybe, yeah. The, by what? By whom? Who embedded this in us? And why would they have embedded it in us? If you have your notes, go ahead and pull them out. If not, lift your hand. We'll get you a set of bulletins so you can follow along with the message. You don't have to take notes, but I'll let you know when I'm almost done. If death isn't the end, what's my future? If death is not the end, what's my future? If we have your email address, you'll get an email uh, today at around 1 o'clock that's got some questions about this series as well as some feedback I'd love to get from you. We all have an epistemology. That's a fancy philosophical word that says how we know what we know. I know what foo-foo and foo-tu taste like because I've experienced it. You have a little bit of an idea on what foo-foo tastes like because I shared it with you, but your epistemology is a little messed up because it's coming through somebody else. How do we get an epistemology? How do we get a knowledge of what heaven is? But we have some myths and misconceptions that can come from our source. Maybe our source is Eastern mysticism or movies or cartoons or Hollywood or cute little caricatures with angel wings or Pollyanna thinking that helped us at a funeral. Grandma's gone to a better place and now she's an angel watching over you. That can help you at a funeral, but it's not going to help you when you have a moment of gut level self-honesty realizing that no, she's passed away, she's gone, she's not coming back, now what? And the honesty of our mortality hits us in the face. And when it does, we tend to usually go to one of two extremes. One, I can't do anything about it, so it's not up to me and I don't care. Or I've got to do everything about it. It's all up to me. What if we just had a better understanding if eternity came into focus? Because once we learn the choices we make here matter over there and life is preparation for eternity, we get to the spot where we don't need to fear death, but are we actually excited about what's on the other side? Because Christ defeated death that's the heart of the gospel. But are we excited about what's on the other side? If you're moving halfway across the world permanently, not for two weeks like I did, if you're moving all the way across the world permanently and not coming back, what would you do? You'd say your goodbyes. You'd go ahead and make sure you have whatever possessions you wanted to take with you. But you'd get as much information you can and you'd prepare for the journey because you're no longer going to be living in a land that's native to you but it's foreign to you. So here's a question I have for you. Do I live as if this world or the next is my home? Do I live like this world or the next is my home? What would change in your life if eternity actually came into focus and it wasn't just something that popped up on the scale at a funeral or popped up on a scale way on down the road? Because I know if you're under 40 right now, you're probably thinking, I'm going to live for another 80 years. Yep, your math is bad, but I know your hope is you're still going to live forever. 
Let's talk about a couple myths and misconceptions we have about heaven. One of them is we can't wait to get to heaven. That's pretty much a myth. The early Christians in the New Testament, they celebrated their death days more than their birth days. Because to them, death wasn't a bad thing. It was a graduation. Paul said this, For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And that's a little bit philosophical. What exactly does he mean? Well, he breaks it down. And he's not suicidal in the slightest. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yeah, what do I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better. That's a different tilt shift, isn't it? He's got a totally different perspective on life and death, and he's not hating life. He's not suicidal. He's not called Kevorkian. He's not moving to Montana. He's not hating life, but he says it's still better to be with Christ. We had some other news this past week that was uh, sad and good. One of the people in our congregation passed away, Grace Schubert. Grace was uh, 92 years old. Grace didn't come much the past year and a half because she was in the nursing home. And her daughter actually goes to First Nazarene, so she'd bring her over here once in a while. Grace lived what seemed like forever, loved God her entire life, was able to recognize her family before she turned unresponsive, and was just faithful. There was no sadness at the funeral other than the sadness of we're going to miss some of the memories we have with grandma or great-grandma or great-great-grandma. But there wasn't a Pollyanna thinking, oh, she's in a better place. There was a confident. She's where she wanted to be. It wasn't just, well, she's not in any pain anymore. Grace wasn't in pain here. She wasn't in pain. But there was not a sourness in, other than the, you know, the funny stories of grandma on a ladder at age 70 painting her own house with nobody else home. You're going, ah, grandma, what are you doing? Grace was just living life. And when life was over, she graduated because she was confident and she knew that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident to prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. What would cause us not to be excited about go to heaven? Because let's be honest, most of us are not. If you get feeling sick, what do you do? Do you go to the doctor and say, Doc, I'm not feeling good. Give me a go there pill. No, we ask the doctor for stay here pills, don't we? We want stay here surgery. We'll take a stay here amputation if we get to stay here as opposed to go there. Is that sinful? Is it selfish? Or maybe do we just have an inaccurate view and both life on earth and life after earth should be highly valued, but we should be cautious how tied we are to this earth because everything we got here is passing away. Maybe another misconception that we have is that heaven's going to be one long church service. You know, the unending church service, never-ending sing-along in the sky. You're just hoping that it's a song you actually like. Some people fear hell. Some people fear heaven because they find no pleasure in thinking about it, and, but they're just glad they're not going to hell. And when you have that thought process, the next thought that hits your head is, man, I feel guilty that I don't, I'm not more spiritual, that heaven doesn't interest me. And then we go, well, I better get as much happiness as I can right now because heaven doesn't hold any happiness. Look at it. It's angel wings and harps and floating around. Who wants that? I better get as much happiness as I can right now. And if you're in the way between me and happiness, I need to get you out of the way. And no one better hinder my free choice on anything because if I want happiness, I got to get it now. The only people that seem to be looking forward to heaven are the people who the stay here pills aren't working anymore. So now they're waiting for the go there pills and they're trying to fill their mind that go there is a good thing instead of stay here. And for some of them, it's working, and they have peace, and some of them, it's not. Why is that? Do we not realize that what God made us to desire, he put in there? Where would we like to live? Besides San Diego. Where would you like to live? How about here? On an earth? But, but with a perfect body that doesn't need a hip replacement every five years. And perfect people around me so we don't have to go to a, to a divorce attorney every 14 years. And a perfect environment that, that sin's not, not all over the place and drunken drivers aren't on the road. And, and, and if, if I was closer to Christ and, and, you know, what you're describing is what Scripture describes heaven as. A resurrected life in a resurrected body with a resurrected Christ on a resurrected earth. The never-ending sing-along in the sky, that doesn't interest us, even if you love going to church. But what I just described, the resurrected life on a resurrected earth, does that interest you? See, another myth is the fact that we're going to be a bunch of disembodied spirits up there. Jesus said that when he was leaving, he was leaving, and it was good because, one, he's going to send the Holy Spirit, and two, he's going to go prepare a place. 
What's a place? A place is by nature physical, not ethereal. It's not an ethereal realm of disembodied spirits. Heaven and hell would be real physical locations. Eternal life is not eternal banishment to an undesired location. I mean, try this, try this. Can you create an appetite right now for gym steak tips? Let me see your hand. Come on, come on. How many of you can go, I could do, yeah, yeah, gym steak tips. Yep, 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 all right. Now, try and create an appetite for this. An eternal existence as a disembodied spirit in a non-physical location. He gave us a body. A body's not bad. We'll talk about that next week. Plato said it was bad. Body's not bad. Scripture says we'll have bodies. Will they look like this one? I don't know. I hope it's a little better than the one I got. You might think the same. Heaven should not bring despair. It's not exile. We don't get exiled to heaven away from earth. We get to go home to heaven away from the exile on earth because on earth we are exiled away from the constant manifest presence of God which we broke off in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Home should feel like home. Another myth. Heaven is not for us to know yet. We're not supposed to know about all that yet, Pastor. The Bible even says that, that we can't know about heaven yet. We're just supposed to know that it's wonderful and majestic, and when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there, and there'll be a mansion in the sky over the hilltop for me, and whatever other words you want to pull out of any songs that have some truth in them and have some uh, Hollywood kind of thinking in them. Doesn't the Bible say we can't know or understand what heaven's like? Let's take a look and see what's been revealed. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and this is the verse people would normally use to, to defend this myth. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Oh, does that mean it must be even better than what our eyes can see and better than what our ears have heard and better than what our minds can conceive? Yes, but that's not the end of the book. It's not the end of the letter. It's not the end of the passage. It's not the end of the sentence. But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. And what has he revealed? We'll be looking at that the next couple of weeks. Scripture talks that the secret things belong to the Lord our God. Okay, he can have the secret things, but the things revealed to us belong to us and our children forever and need to be passed down if they've been revealed. What if you could know more about eternity and not making stuff up out of thin air? God commanded the apostle John, hey, dude, what you're seeing right now, write it down and share it. And we call it the book of Revelation. Another myth about heaven is that all roads lead there. According to our culture and many other cultures, man, all you have to do to go to heaven is just die. I mean, there's a few really hardcore atheists that are out there. There's a, most of the atheists are not hardcore. Most of them just say, I don't believe in God because I don't want to have anyone telling me what to do. In which case, you're in the right nation because you can get away with just about anything. But the average atheist, that's hard, they're really hardcore atheists. They're, you're just going to go on the ground. They're going to put you in a box. It's over. Your existence is done. But nearly everyone else thinks they're going somewhere, and they think they're going somewhere good because, because they've been good. Because they didn't kill anybody. Yeah, no, no. So far, so good. I haven't killed anybody. Because they didn't. Uh, they weren't bad people compared to other people. Because they were, they were an okay person. Because they tried to do good. Is that really the requirement to get into heaven? I mean, come on. Even Sam's Club has a requirement, doesn't it? <laughs> But if we're not careful, we'll get, the, we'll get the old-timer view where, hey, you've got to be really good to get to heaven. You've got to do this, 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 this. And that's not the gospel of grace. I mean, Christ defeated death, and he opened that opportunity. Some people are shocked to think that God would allow anyone to go to hell. How could he do that? They're also shocked when they get a speeding ticket and someone's holding them accountable for anything. We shouldn't be a, a surprised if God holds people accountable for their actions. What we should be surprised about if God opens a way for us to be forgiven of our actions and realize how amazing his nature is in that respect. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 7. Enter through the narrow gate. Wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through that. And many of us in this room have been on that road. We were on that road for a long time. And some of us were breaking the speed limit on that road. And when the cops started chasing us, we just put the pedal to the floor and went even faster. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. See, the amazing thing about the gospel of Christ is, isn't just, hey, it's narrow, you better be really good. No, Christ is that gate. He's also the road. He's the gate on the road and opened it up so we could have that opportunity and it's available to everybody. Another myth about heaven is that we think it's our default destination. 
And if you understand your computer terminology, a default usually means the choice that's made for you if you don't choose something else. I kind of wish there would have been one on the, some of the tests I took in high school. That probably would have helped me out. It's a selection automatically made if the user doesn't make a choice. You have that when you go through the drive through at McDonald's. I want number five, please, with Diet Dr. Pepper. They don't have that in Ivory Coast. Diet Dr. Pepper? Man, I missed that. Wait a second, don't I also get to choose my side dish? Can I have fries or apple wedges or a salad or from at Wendy's a, a chili? Chili? I can get chili, right? But what if I choose nothing? What if I don't make a choice? What am I going to get? Fries. Default. But if I make a choice, I might have some other options. I was actually at Brahms the other day, and I said, I want that sandwich, but is there anything else you got besides fries? Um, I got a banana here. I go, I'll take it. <laughs> I got a banana. Default selection is what you're going to get. Why do we think that heaven's our default option? Because we're Americans, and we're good, and good people do good things and get to go to a good place where there's a good God, and that works wonderful in a Pixar storyline. But we aren't good. Look at our nation. Look at our nation's history. Look at our race's history. Not just white race, the human race. Look at our human race history. And where do we think it's going to go in the next 200 years? Do you think we're going to improve and evolve to make even better decisions and be kinder to even more people? Or are we going to create new ways to do evil? Which we've done incessantly. We are more wicked and sinful than we ever thought we could be. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and forgiven. That is the gospel. Humankind says, you can only be loved and forgiven if you've been good. And that's why we think we're good, because we want to be loved and forgiven. Christ says very plainly, no, we're wicked and we're sinful, and that's why we have a Savior and not a helper, because he rescues us from our sin. So at the same time, wait a second, I have to be good before I can be loved and forgiven. Nope. Not according to Christ. You can be loved and forgiven while at the same time you are struggling and drowning in sin. Heaven is not our default destination. C.S. Lewis said this about the road to hell. The safest road to hell is a gradual one. I made a decision for Christ in May 19, 1985, and I chose a new road. I've never seen anyone choose the road to hell. I've never talked to anyone, oh, no, man, I gave my life to Satan back in May 19, 1985, and it's been downhill ever since. Never met that person. The safest road to hell is a gradual one. It's a gentle slope. It's soft underfoot without either sudden turnings or without milestones or without signposts. Let me ask you this. Have you been raised with Christ? In your heart, where you die to yourself. Water baptism is a symbolism of that, but you don't have to be baptized to be saved. You don't have to be baptized to go ahead and have Christ raised in your heart. But have you been raised with Christ? If so, set your heart on things above. Because whether you are in an American culture or in a Vorian culture, things are screaming for your heart. Things of earth are screaming for your heart. But if you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above. It doesn't mean you don't go to work. It doesn't mean you're, you're so heavenly minded, you know earthly good. You may have heard that statement before. I've met people like that. I think I was that person at one time in my life. I don't want to be that person again. Some people are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. But set your heart on things above. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Tilt, shift. Because the things that we see in the commercials, the things that we see in our life, the things that we see seem so big and humongous. And the enemy says, you'll never get past that failure. You'll never get past that divorce. You'll never get past that death. You're never going to get out of that depression. You're never going to be able to move forward. And at that moment, what he says sure sounds accurate, doesn't it? Come on, some of you can look back five, ten years or five or ten months and go, that's where I was. We need a different perspective, an eternal perspective. Set your hearts on things above Set your minds on things above. What would happen in your life if eternity actually came into focus? Oh, pastor, that's no big deal. Like, I'm under 40, pastor. I'm going to live for another 80 years like you were joking. That's, that's my future home. I don't need to worry about that. It is your future home, but it should be your current reference point for how you're living. When I was on that plane, I'm glad that the plane wasn't just worried about where it was over the Atlantic Ocean. I'm glad it had a reference point of Chicago. 
And it had a reference point that it was following. It was the future destination, but it was a reference point for how that pilot was behaving at that time. If heaven's our future home, and if it will be your current reference point, it will change how you view problems, how you view people, how you view people that are problems in your life. It will change how you view cultures, finances, the souls of the people you encounter. The key word in that scripture there is the word set, because it's not automatic. It's got to be intentional. Natural is to focus on the things of the world, earthly things. And I'm not necessarily saying they're all bad. There's nothing wrong with trying to get a job promotion. There's nothing wrong with having ambition. There's nothing wrong if you're trying to upgrade your car from a clunker to something that actually starts every single time you turn the key. That's actually a really good thing. But what's your heart set on? What's your mind set on? Uh, Brian, can you bring your team up, friend? I came across this quote, and I thought it was powerful. You've heard it said, like I mentioned before, some people are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. I can't stand those Christians, and you probably can't either. But since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world, we've become more ineffective in this one. Let me say that again. As Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world and we started ignoring heaven, we start to become ineffective in this one. Would we not be more effective in this world if we had a better focus on the next one? And that's what I want to be encouraging you for the next three weeks in this series, is this simple statement. A focus set on earth is beneath your future. It's not necessarily sinful. It's not going to take you to hell. It won't get you to heaven. It's just beneath your future. If your future is playing in the NBA, it's probably time to quit just practicing free throws on an eight-foot rim. A focus set on earth is beneath your future. The future he has planned for us. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has conceived, but in the next couple of weeks we'll take a look and see what God has revealed about it. And as you look at that, I think you're going to go, I'd like a reservation, please. Would you stand with me this morning? Fathers, we humble our hearts and then we draw into your presence. I ask that your presence would not just fill this place, but would impact and impress upon our hearts. That it isn't a bunch of American religion that is it isn't an American religious background that has impressed eternity in our hearts, but you have put it there. And some of us in this room have tried to get away from it. We've tried to think that we're just, just evolved protoplasm and we're just here for a short time and then our existence is over. But that is so hard to do and we've not even been successful at doing that. And why is that? Is there something that you've wired in us, like your word says, that you put eternity in our hearts and minds? Speak to our heart as we draw near to you this morning, Lord.